Right, can I start now, Caitlin? Yeah. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar on, uh, uh, you know, Europe, uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine and Europe, and how, and well, both the Europe and the UK, and how, how um, things have happened and how things have progressed. And obviously, it's just after the uh, first anniversary of this dreadful uh, invasion that took place on the 24th of February last year. And a, um, and I, um, and I'm, uh, I'm David Gow, uh, an executive member of the European Movement in Scotland and a former uh, European uh, editor or business editor in particular of The Guardian based in Brussels. And uh, obviously the, the, uh, we know that in the last year, I think the estimates are that this war has, the toll is something like 200,000 dead and uh, wounded uh, taken together, both on the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side. It may well be more, we don't know. And at the moment, it looks as if we could be in for, as one thing we wish to discuss tonight, uh, we could be in for a long haul. It could be, who knows, we could be discussing this again in, in uh, February 2024. Uh, you know, as we know, there are lots and lots of um, a trench warfare, all sorts of things. Both sides are said to be running out of ammunition. We don't know. I mean, in some ways we do know, in some ways we don't anyway. But anyway, here to discuss uh, where we are in terms of the war and what it's meant for the UK and for Europe, as well as obviously the Ukrainians and Russians to some, you know, are, and we're joined by uh, Juliet Carbo, uh, Professor Juliet Carbo, who is uh, the uh, Professor of Foreign Policy at Edinburgh University and co-director of the Scottish, of the relatively new Scottish Council on Global Affairs. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Christos Katsioulis, uh, from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation or Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, which, as he says, is close to but uh, independent of the German Social Democrats Party, De Democratic Party, now in coalition, leading the coalition government in Berlin. And he runs the regional office, the FES regional office for peace and cooperation in Vienna, but used to work for four years, we gather, we gather uh, during the great Brexit period, malheureusement, in London. And we're also joined, as you can see from the cloisters of Kivity's uh, Backdrop, uh, by Stephen uh, Gethins, who is the uh, Professor of Practice in, inter in International uh, Relations at St Andrews University, a uh, former MP, and was the SNP uh, spokesman on Europe in the House of Commons. And so anyway, so uh, we'll start off. Can I just say that if you're going to ask questions, and we will be plenty of time, we hope, for questions uh, you know, later on, please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. It's, much, it's easier for me personally to monitor it if you do that way. Okay, so that's that. Anyway, so Stephen, could you kick off for us with a kind of, you know, overview of uh, an aperçu, as it were, of where we are in terms of this horrible war a year after it started? Yeah, I, I will. So, David, thanks for organising this really important um, discussion to, to everybody in the European movement. This is a pivotal issue for anybody who cares about Europe and the future of Europe. So what I thought I'd do, David, if, if it's OK, I'm going to give a very, very general overview of where we are, um, how we got here and where we and where things might go in the future. But also I'd like to pose a couple of questions that I think that those who believe in the future of Europe and European solidarity really need to consider because we're now in a situation that the European Union that we that the UK left is no longer the same European Union but I'll come to that towards the end of my remarks but, but I think that th therein there's some interesting areas for discussion. Hmm. The first thing that I want to say and comment on is we talk about this being a year you know, I've, I've heard, I know you you didn't mention it, but others talk about a year since the start of the war. Of course, in terms of Ukraine, Ukrainians will always remind you that it is nine years since the start of this particular war, because it was in 2014 that Russia annexed Crimea, part of Ukrainian territory. And it was the same time that we saw that upsurge in violence in, in the Donbass region. 
that mm. had already cost many thousands of lives as a hot war um, by the time the tanks rolled across the border um, and they tried to seize Kiev a year ago, those horrifying scenes that we saw. So I think it's fair to say that there has been an acceleration of that war, an extension of a war that already existed. And I, I say that um, because Ukrainians are always rightly quite keen to remind us of the background. And why is that important? Well, that's important because I think there are a number of failures in terms of UK foreign policy, but also broader European foreign policy when it came to dealing with Vladimir Putin's Russia. And I'm not saying that there was any causal fact, factor in this war. There was only one person to blame for this war of aggression, which is Vladimir Putin. But there were areas that we missed. And if you look at the way that this horrible war is, 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 has, has been carried out, we should have known better in terms of the administration. If you think about it, if you think about it, 20 years ago, the United Nations described Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, as being the most destroyed city on earth because you saw the violence that was visited upon Chechnya during those two brutal wars that took place within the borders of the Russian Federation. If you look at Syria, and actually I was um, speaking to colleagues from Yemen and Syria yesterday who quite rightly remind us that that war, that horrible war in Syria is ongoing. And if you look at some of the tactics that have been visited by the Russian military on that country as it seeks to prop, uh, to prop up um, Assad's regime at a horrible cost to the citizens of Syria. And if you look even elsewhere in Georgia where proxy Russian um, forces were in areas like South Ossetia, Abkhazia um, and, and elsewhere, none of us should have been in any, none of us should, 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 should have been turning a blind eye to the kind of administration we were dealing with. And I'll now turn to the people of Russia themselves. I've spent a bit of time in Russia and you will see the human rights abuses that take place. It's an incredibly dangerous place to be an opposition politician or a journalist for that matter. Um, and I can remember meeting human rights, democracy and rule of law protesters, uh, sorry, campaigners in private, because to go public with some of their activities would have been extremely dangerous. And yet throughout this period, and I think this background is quite helpful, um, if, if you'll forgive me, David, but throughout this period, we also had, if you look at the UK in terms of our own failures, that in the UK, you still had dirty money sloshing through London financial markets. Mm. You still had disinformation and the polarization of our politics, not due entirely to some of the propaganda that was coming from Russia, but it played a part in it. And we even had the sight just over four years ago of Russia being at the center of world sports, hosting the World Cup, for goodness sake, in 2018, four years after the start of that war in Ukraine. Now, I don't say this to blame. I think every single political party in the UK, and you could say this for the rest of Europe, but others are probably more um, qualified to talk about this than I am, were at fault in how we approached this. That is not to say we were at fault in terms of this war, but I think in our underestimation of and our misreading of the regime that we were dealing with in the Kremlin, it is worth reflecting on the mistakes that were made prior to February um, of last year. And that's something we need to reflect on. We still need to deal with the dirty money. We still need to deal with polarization. And we still need to deal with that that hot military threat that we've seen in Ukraine. Um, and what's been quite interesting over that period, and I mentioned this earlier on, I'll move on, is the way that Europe and the European Union is increasingly emerging as a security actor. And I'm not going to recount it word for word, but in September 2021, Ursula von der Leyen gave an incredibly interesting State of the Union speech in September 2021 in the aftermath of the fall of Kabul. And in that speech, and it's worth going back to have a read, she set out the security um, role that the European Union was increasingly taking in terms of the fall of Kabul. And if you look at that in terms of building a security role within the European Union, but also non-military means of security, such as our food security, our energy security, building up the NGO sector, the peace building arm, the soft power arm, that actually the arguments that, um, that President von der Leyen made in September 2021, four months, five months before 
that February um, 2022 extension of the war in Ukraine are even more applicable now. And it's been quite interesting to see over the past year the acceleration in the security um, role that the EU has had to play. You've seen an increasing role for cooperation between NATO and the EU. And what's particularly interesting is that the European Union is, of course, driven by the priorities of its member states. And sometimes we in Western Europe will think about when the UK was a member, what are the UK's priorities, what are Franco-German priorities. But actually what's been really interesting has been seeing the cohesion of the Nordics and Baltics, who are all EU member states, all with very clear foreign policy goals when it comes to Russia, all of whom have an existential threat to the East. This isn't something that we discuss and debate that's going on distant. As, as, and also, if you think about Baltic politicians, you know, I remember the former Lithuanian health commissioner was born in a gulag. He was born in a gulag. This is living memory in terms of what has happened to the East. And what's also interesting is that you've now narrowed down the countries of the European Union that sit outside the who are not NATO members, I think, down to Austria and um, Austria and Ireland now, once Finnish and Swedish accession to NATO is complete. And that brings the two blocks even closer, or the two organisations even closer together. So the EU is a security actor. The biggest challenge the EU faces at the moment is, uh, is a security crisis, number one, which if you're Poland, the Baltic states, the Nordics, or anybody with a border from Russia, is your number one domestic political priority right now that your voters expect you to act on. But also you see the way that um, the failed energy policies and the connections to, and the, the reliance on Russian energy has been reduced far down because we can no longer afford to be spent to be piling hundreds of millions of euros into Kremlin coffers when it is conducting a bloody war of aggression on a, on, on a potential EU member state. So the EU is changing. Food and energy security are really important. And increasingly that collaboration and cooperation and the, and the way that NATO and the European Union um, um, complement one another in terms of that security role. And we also know where have the big domestic failures been in recent years? Well, the big domestic failures in recent years, certainly if you think about it from a UK perspective, has often been not in the success on the battlefield, but in the success, sorry, the lack of success and stabilization afterwards in places like Libya and Iraq. And if you think about Libya as a failed state, just on Europe's doorstep, you also see areas where the European Union could be expected to step up to the plate in, in the coming years. And in terms of Ukraine, what's fascinating, Ukraine and its citizens see their future as being part of the European Union. They see their future as being at the heart of the European project as part of the family of nations. And it's difficult to argue with the Ukrainians when they are spilling blood right now for that right. It's difficult, and, and, and in that regard, you're also seeing something that we don't often see in such quick real time, which is Ukraine is a, a nation with an ancient history and a long history, but you're really seeing this nation building and this society pooling together in the face of this dreadful aggression. Now, it's something nobody would ever have wanted, but it is what it is. And you do see the, 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 the nation pulling together quite astonishingly, as well as support for joining the European Union, joining NATO, really um, increase quite dramatically in terms of support. And at the same time, if you look at public sympathy, it is still there in the United States and in the rest of Europe. There's huge public sympathy for arming Ukraine and continuing to defend Ukraine a year on. That being said, you know, things have a dreadful habit, and I just mentioned Syria earlier on, of slipping from the public consciousness, and that will be a challenge over the coming year. So I'm mindful I've spoken for about 10 minutes. So let me just, David, let, let, let me, if I may, just chuck a few questions out there for us all to think about. If the European Union is changing, is more of a security actor, what does that mean for the North Atlantic Security Alliance? What does it mean in particular if you see the election of a future um, US administration, which is less committed to European security. We as Europeans have perhaps relied for too long on others um, bearing a, a significant burden in terms of our security. Can we afford to do that anymore? As Europe steps up to the plate, in what way does the European Union change? And what happens in Russia? 
and what happens in Russia over the coming years. I, I don't think you see a set of circumstances whereby you ask the Ukrainians to start to compromise because and ask them to give up land. Russia invaded Ukraine. There's a simple solution to this war, and that is for Russia to leave Ukrainian territory. And then what happens in terms of the UK's own relationship? Now, we've seen the damage that Brexit's done in terms of the economy. But one thing that even people like me who might you know, believe in, in, in independence can't ignore is that the UK is a significant European security actor. And if the European Union is to develop its role as a security actor, where is there space for increased cooperation between the UK and the European Union in that sphere as well? And I actually think that's an area where we can start to have a more sensible discussion. So a lot to think about, a lot of issues in play, but I thought, David, I'd try and give the widest possible, and, and forgive me if I've gone slightly over time, um, just to sort of open things up a little bit for two very knowledgeable experts you've got coming in next. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. No, those are absolutely crucial questions. I mean, one which you haven't brought in, actually, funny enough, but another big, huge one is what is the role that China could play, for example? Are the, uh, is, is Putin going to have to call, not least for, you know, not least in terms of arms, let alone zero you know, actual physical and financial support? Is he going to have to call on, on President Xi in order to help him out? in this, you know, as, as things go forward. Uh, I mean, are things, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, but are things so bad that actually, the, you know, the, the Russia in, in effect would become a kind of almost, not, not quite a satellite state of China, but actually become a kind of subordinate role in, in, in a very powerful relationship. That's one of them. Anyway, so we're talking about, so it's very nicely because you've led on as well to with, with Putin and so on and so forth and without, and, and of course Zelensky, but others too. Uh, we could talk about Macron. We could talk about uh, Schultz. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure our friend in Vienna, uh, Christos, will be talking about about all our Schultz. Um, a and so on. anyway. So that brings us to neatly to Juliet, uh, who's going to talk to us about leadership and the role of leadership at the start of this campaign, a war, a meaning of war, but also now. And look, and going forward, where we're going to, where where it will take us forward. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the European Movement in in Scotland for for having me today. Um, as David said, I want to put a particular spin on our discussion of the conflict in Ukraine and how Europe and others. You'll see that I'm not just focused on Europe, uh, but other states as well. How how others have responded to it, and I want to focus on the importance of individual political leaders in all of this. And that's not to say that the structural features of the NATO alliance, of EU as a security actor, the dynamics of power rivalries, military capabilities, national interests are, are not important. Of course, they are important. Um, but I want to highlight leaders and their role in building and interpreting these dynamics and interest, because I think this angle is typically not given enough attention, but is certainly part of the picture here. We must, of course, start with Putin. Um, Putin is the ultimate foreign policy decision maker in Russia, and this was a war of choice for Putin. I'm not persuaded that this was NATO's fault, as some have argued. NATO, after all, had been expanding since the end of the Cold War, and Russia, while never really happy about it, did not always opt for an aggressive response like this one. Ukrainian membership in NATO in 2021, uh, 2022, was not inevitable, nor was it imminent. Nor do I think this was entirely a war to shore up Putin's domestic support inside Russia. It does feed into some nationalist sentiment and anti-West narrative that Putin has been building over the last decade. And Putin was able to use the annexation of Crimea to overcome uh, temporarily discontent, some discontent inside Russia uh, in 2014. But in 2022, Putin was not in danger of being replaced. His political survival was not at stake. And it's not clear that outright occupation of Ukraine, Ukraine, presumably Putin's goal at the start of this at last year's, the stage of this conflict, would have been popular in Russia. And that's one reason he doesn't really call it a war. Um, it's not clear that it would be supported by the people if they had a chance to, to do so. So what about Putin led to this choice? Well, I think Putin has been changing. His anti-West beliefs have solidified over the course of his rule, particularly since 2012. So Stephen's right to point out some of the seeds of this aggressive behavior in other Russian foreign policy throughout Putin's rule, including in Chechnya in the early days. 
but I think I think the invasion of Ukraine, uh, the 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 stage of this last year was a step level change in in Putin's uh, activities. I think his beliefs have changed. I think his confidence of succeeding has also grown, partly fed by his perception of the West response or lack of response in 2014, and what he sees as success for Russia in Russia's involvement in Syria. And this confidence is no longer checked by different perspectives as it was earlier in his rule. By most accounts, his advisory circle has shrunk over time. So by 2022, P Putin arguably believed in his own pr propaganda about Ukraine, about the West. And there's indication that he's thinking more about his legacy. So I think Putin was in a place, a certain place in his mind, not, not, not correct, but a certain place to interpret his international situation and his domestic situation in a certain way and are intervened to, in his mind, solve the so-called problem with Ukraine that he saw as part of his legacy. Again, a step-level change in his foreign policy record and a very risky decision. Um, so that's Putin. Uh, the unexpected response from the West is also connected to individual leaders. In an article that my co-authors and I will publish in the next issue of International Affairs that should come out any day now, uh, we argue that the West response would have looked very different if Trump had won the 2020 election. So we play a little counterfactual game with, with history. Um, Trump would not have so quickly condemned Russia. He was confident that he could just talk to Putin to resolve any conflict. He would not have supported Ukraine, which he viewed as backward and corrupt. And he would not have shared intelligence about Russia's buildup and intentions. Trust ha Trump has a very high level of distrust of others, and this extends to his NATO allies, to the US's NATO allies, and to his own intelligence community. US foreign policy may have eventually, under Trump, evolved to support Ukraine. But Trump would have resisted this enough in the early days, enough to possibly have changed the course of conflict in favor of Russia early on. On the other hand, Biden's reaction, his strong support for Ukraine, his condemnation of Russia, his push for a quick common NATO European front with sanctions and military support is very consistent with his personality, his experience as senator and vice president, his general beliefs about international relations and his specific beliefs about Ukraine and Russia and the importance of NATO. And it's not just the leader of the US who is important in the Western response, as, as David alluded to in, in introducing me, what if, what if Merkel would have still been in power? Well, eventually coming to the same pro-Ukrainian anti-Russian stance, would she have changed foreign policy so quickly? Or was it Schultz's relative inexperience in foreign policy that helps explain the timing and the extent of this change? And what if the French election had happened sooner and Le Pen would have won? And would another Italian leader have been the architect of sanctions, as was Draghi with his economic and banking background? And Zelensky, would another Ukrainian leader have declined the exile that was offered to him? Would another leader have had the media background that helped him mobilize and continues to help him mobilize Ukraine and Western support? And there's a good argument to make that China support for Russia directly comes from a changing Xi Jinping, and that India's position also stems from Modi's belief. And these are more than armchair speculations. These leaders could have been different, they could have reacted differently, and the conflict would not look the same as it does today. So what does this mean going forward uh, for the war and for the Allied response today? I do think Western leaders and allied leaders are more constrained now. They don't have as much choice to kind of define the situation that they did at the beginning of the conflict. They've established a strong consensus. They've been a very important part of the establishment of that consensus. But now they have little leeway to act because of this consensus. But still, leaders remain at the forefront of interpreting any signals from Russia, of deciding how to cooperate or, or approach China on this of making decisions for new types of military assistance. And Biden's trip to Kyiv last week was very consistent with his personal involvement and his, his very personal interest in Ukraine. But these leaders may be replaced, um, not maybe for their foreign policies towards Russia directly, but maybe indirectly for the economic cost or for other reasons. And here's where domestic politics comes in and interacts with the importance of leaders. New leaders may face 
different domestic political constraints and be more or less responsive to them. Western publics are pretty supportive of their country's policies in this conflict. Uh, and even if not, if there's a cross-party consensus at the leader level, leaders can fairly safely ignore public opinion on foreign policy. But what they can't ignore is the economic challenges that erode public support for them or for their party, even if that public still believes in the sanctions regime and is, and, and is pro-Ukraine. So policies on the war may get caught up in electoral politics as we go along, not equally in all countries, but possibly maybe in, in Germany and the U.S., or regardless of public opinion on the conflict, current leaders may be replaced. There is a, a chance that Trump may be may replace Biden. There's no sign of Putin going away soon. You never know. But most analysts of Russian politics say any new leader would not necessarily end the war and may be more aggressive. And when personalist regimes like Russia's collapse, there's a very messy and unstable succession period, which would make dealing with Russia even more complex, although it would also open up a chance for the West to establish back channels with less anti-Western elites. But for now, what is important to remember is that compelling Russia to act in certain ways, deterring Russia from doing certain things, all of this is first and foremost affected by how Putin sees things, like it or not. One can't simply raise the military and economic cost in any objective sense. These costs and, and any benefits are calculated in the mind of Putin. And it's very difficult to know what's in that mind, especially since there's not much talk and dialogue with, with Russia at the moment. But there are indications that Putin thinks of this conflict as a long-term situation, and therefore the West does has to as well. That Putin is very confident still of his ability to win in some way eventually. And he may not getting the cost, he may not be getting the cost of the war communicated to him. There are signs that he's even more isolated and that contradictory advice is reaching him even less than it was before the war. So Putin is unlikely to see the war as a mistake, especially his mistake. Leaders rarely backtrack from such extreme aggressive policies. They and their beliefs become entrapped by their own actions. And I guess the takeaway from all this, um, not, not very optimistic, but is that we just need to keep understanding the leaders in this conflict on, on all sides, on all issues, their motives, their psychological and political constraints in which they operate. World orders, international structures, military capabilities, national interests are all important, but these are all these kind of dynamics and forces are for, they don't come from nowhere. They're created by leaders making important decisions, and they're interpreted through their prisms of beliefs and individual characteristics. So I'll stop there. Well, wow. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, that has opened up a whole load of uh, other questions as well, basically. Uh, can I just sort of ask one quick one before we go on to Christos? I mean, you talked about he wants to win in some kind of way. Do we know what that is? And is it is it is it now? Is it just Donet? Is it just that you know the, the the whole sort of Donbass region? Is it the whole of the Ukraine? And is it as a lot of people in in uh, you know the Stephen talked about the you know the Baltics and the uh, and, and also the kind of some of the more Slavic countries like around them, a uh, fearing that actually they could be next. So is it is is are we actually seriously talking about that that kind of aggressive you know what people call imperialism? So the last part, I don't think so. Although Putin has been changing, he could be changing during this war that 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 makes him um, hungry for more aggressive behaviors. But I think at the beginning of the war, the the read on on Putin was this this is, Ukraine has a special place in a way in in his mind in the way he's kind of um, constructed uh, the history of Russia. I guess Moldova would be the only one that I would put in there as a as the most likely possible other aggression, I, you know, and, and less provoked, I, just from my perspective, but this is, we don't know this information. Um, we don't know what winning means for him yet and what winning means may be changing. Um, so this is where we need more intelligence and, 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 and more back channel information if that's possible. Um, academic exchange with Russian academics has been 
compromised by this war, and maybe that's the right thing to do, but there's a loss to that as well. Quite, exactly. That is one of the things, the most striking things, I think, is, is uh, you know, having myself been, I mean, I've uh, been to Russia but quite a, quite a lot of times, actually, is how little we know about what's really going on there, what are, what, what are people thinking, what are the Slaviki, what are they called, uh, thinking and so on. Anyway, but Christos, you've written an awful lot about uh, defense issues and about cooperation. And of course, you're based in Vienna and you have a German background. And, you know, it's often said that the uh, Germany is much closer to Russia than any other kind of European uh, country in the, in the, in, in, in the sense of the war, uh, since World War II. Uh, how is it seen? How does this whole thing unfold from your perspective? And, uh, how do you see, how do you think the Europeans have uh, uh, behaved and have, have they adopted the right approach? Have the Germans adopted the right approach? But not just the Germans, everybody else in Europe. And uh, what do you see as the prospects in the next year or so? Thank you very much, uh, David, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I will probably not try to judge the German government or the European Union. I'll just try to describe a little bit what I see as the effects of the war on Europe. Um, and I'll start with uh, what Juliet said. Um, she described all the leaders um, being in, implied in this effort to kind of support Ukraine um, and also try to look into Putin's brain, but she never mentioned once Ursula von der Leyen or Charles Michel. Um, which is, I think, very telling um, about the European Union as a security actor. Um, and uh, I, I'd just like to remind us that when we talk about the European Union and security, the, the idea of security that was kind of installed in, inside the European Union before this war was all about crisis management, of trying to deal with smaller issues like in the Balkans. Um, and we weren't even sending tr European troops to Libya. So this war has changed matters fundamentally. Um, and now we're talking about the European Union as a security and defense entity. Um, because this, this war has a few effects on, on Europe and I'll try to describe first the unifying effects, then a little bit the dividing effects, then the context on which these, uh, on which the war is understood. And then I'll have a look at, a little bit into Germany and then try to have an, a perspective on how the European Union could develop in the future. Um, if we look at the, the, the unifying effects, um, I think this war has created a far more common perception of Russia uh, than before. Uh, before this war, you described the special relationship of Germany with Russia, and we can um, uh, deal with that a little bit later maybe, but we had different camps in Europe, um, camps that on the one hand saw Russia as a potential partner for cooperation, who had the perspective of a country developing slightly step-by-step step maybe and with throwbacks um, towards a Western liberal, um, maybe not democratic society, but a kind of a, a, a very big Hungary on our Eastern borders. Um, and you had other states who had experiences with Russia like the Baltics, like Poland, um, perceiving Russia as a potential danger for our security. And this is gone. We now see, um, as, Europe, as members of the European Union, we see Russia quite clearly as a danger, as a threat for our security. Um, and there is also right now the, the um, belief and uh, the persuasion that we also need to decouple economically from Russia. You know, David, very much uh, and very well, the kind of Handel durch Wandel policy of Germany, this kind of change through trade um, this was, to be honest, uh, for the past 20 years, kind of uh, a nice advertisement for a policy that was focused on economic profits, um, and the change issue was far, far in the back of our minds, uh, but this has gone also. We have started to decouple from Russia, um, and I think the third uh, issue where we are very much on the same, uh, same page now is that there is a need to strengthen our capabilities to defend ourselves. Um, uh, something that in the East of Europe has al already been there, but now we also see the same in, in Germany, 
Um, and even in, in, in Austria, where I'm sitting right now, um, which is one of the four islands, I'd say, the, the still neutral islands in the European Union, it's uh, Austria, Ireland, Malta and Cyprus, um, and Austria believing to be a very special country and spending, I think, 0.6% of GDP for defense until now. But let me also look a little bit at the dividing effects, um, because what we see in this war is not only um, an, uh, a unity that we didn't believe in, Putin didn't believe in the European Union, in having this sanctioned packages, now the 10th package um, uh, with, uh, uh, with unanimous decisions, the very, very quick adaptation of existing European Union um, uh, instruments like the peace facility, for example, to support Ukraine flexibly and quite quickly and without applying bureaucratic logics. Um, and I think would also nobody believe would, that the European Union would offer a membership perspective to Ukraine anytime soon. So this is the unity effect. But on the other side, we see um, differences and huge differences. And if you see especially on how Poland and Germany are discussing um, the question of how to approach this war, how to support Ukraine, you see that there are still different objectives here. Um, when you look at the question, should Ukraine join NATO or the European Union, um, you don't hear so many leaders um, saying different things, but I'm pretty sure that behind closed doors, there are huge debates. Um, and I don't believe, for example, that the Austrian government um, or the French government, um, uh, for, for that matter, would agree to um, a membership of, the Europe, of, of Ukraine in the European Union quite, uh, rather soon. And the same applies to NATO. You have different approaches towards how to deal with Russia um, when it comes to ending this war. I think in the very beginning, you have this impression, especially in France, Germany, but also in Italy, that the main aim should be to find some kind of peace, um, whereas other parts of Europe are looking far more into the question, how can we deter Russia forever and not kind of award this aggression um, and, and, and by finding justice here. Um, so there are different scenarios for ending this war. And I think Europe is not on the same page here. Um, we have scenarios like freezing the situation at the borders of 2021. And Stephen said that the war began in 2014, not 2021. There are others who try to um, approach a situation uh, like in uh, like Ukraine, controlling its borders of 1991, meaning Crimea, Donbass and Luhansk and all these um, occupied territories. And there are also a group of, uh, of Europeans trying to, uh, to push as much as possible to kind of have a full victory against Russia and bring um, Vladimir Putin to trial in Den Haag. Um, and I think these are very different objectives, hampering our, our future approach and, uh, and, and also hampering us in this long war we're approaching. Um, and this shows, I think, that the repercussion of this war are read and understood on the context of, on, on a national context. Um, I, I um, uh, alluded a little bit to how differently Germany is approaching it. We see this Zeitenwende, the watershed moment in Germany. You have a change of beliefs, of foreign policy beliefs, Whereas in Poland, it's kind of a belief that we were already right on, um, in, in the long term. Um, and if you look to France, it's this kind of idea that France is a big foreign policy actor and has maybe to adapt a little bit, but there is no kind of revamping or, or re, um, reinterpreting anything um, uh, quite new. Um, and that is, that is um, the source, I think, of, of a, a huge lot of distrust between main actors inside the European Union that is still um, kind of holding us back in becoming what Stephen alluded to, a, a real um, and able actor on the field of security uh, and defense. However, I believe that this is more necessary than ever. Um, and if I can remind you of the Balkan Wars in 1991, there was already a foreign, foreign minister of Luxembourg, I think, who said, this is the hour of Europe. And this is 20, uh, 32 years ago. Um, if this is not the hour of Europe, I think we can't wake up forever. Um, because we're in, as, as, as Julia described it, we're in the very lucky situation that US leadership is being provided right now in a transatlantic matter, manner, 
and with a, um, an approach of partnership. The Biden administration is taking decisions in, in very close cooperation with its European partners. Um, so we're still lucky to have this leadership bringing us forward. Um, but what we need is the European Union being able to make these decisions itself, to have a stronger presence inside NATO. And I think this is one of the, um, the, the perspectives that this war opened up. The idea of developing an independent European Union of NATO is gone. It's the question of how big can the European pillar inside NATO be? How big of a burden can we carry? Um, so this is one of the existing op opportunities. The second opportunity is, and that applies also to the United Kingdom, this war has created a climate of cooperation, of a climate of common, um, of a common place we're in as democracies um, and as um, uh, uh, proponents of a rules-based order that includes the United Kingdom. And I think that also applies, uh, that, that also offers the a space for ideas of how this European Union can integrate others in a different matter than just membership. So we can flexibly, um, more flexibly approach the issues of cooperation inside the European Union, which is very necessary if we want to integrate the U integrate Ukraine. Because to be honest, integrating Ukraine and the Western Balkans in a European Union as it is now is quite impossible and wouldn't fly. So we need to think of a flexible uh, architecture of um, of Europe to be able to follow through on the promise that we have given the, uh, the, the Ukrainian people. Remember what damage NATO did in 2008 when they opened a door and said nobody ever will walk through the door. And we shouldn't um, um, have the same problem and the same um, false promise uh, as the European Union right now. Um, I'll stop here. Um, by and, and just want to say one one word on the on the issues that affect Europe as a whole um, that Juliet and Stephen alluded to. I think there is a belief in Russia that this war is gonna take years, and that autocracies can endure longer. That the resilience of autocratic systems is stronger than democracies. It's, it's a test that we've never had before, and we're still able, and that applies especially to Germany, to kind of cushion the effects for our people. But I, I'm, um, I think what we need to, uh, to to look forward to is, and and to think about very clever, uh, very very clearly is, how can we um, strengthen our resilience in the long term so as not to award uh, Russia in this in this aggression. And I'll stop it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I just ask a couple of questions to you directly? One is, I mean, since you alluded at the end there to, to Joe, is, is, do you think, Joe, I mean, you're right. I mean, because I was very struck when I was the correspondent that, that was in, in, in Germany and I was, funnily enough, I was quite close. Uh, I mean, I don't mean as personally, but I mean uh, professionally to Volker Ruhr when he was the German defense minister, uh, CDU, of course, uh, and so on, and we, in which we discussed a, a lot of times about about Germany's role in the world, and particularly its kind of anxieties about you know acting out of area and so on and so. Forth. Is Germany at, even now prepared for the kind of long war, the prolonged war that you've been talking about? No, not at all. Um, we, we're still developing in this kind of foreign policy role that is thrown upon us. Um, you know that the, the very difficult place Germany comes from when it, com when it comes to military, um, and that still hampers our thinking. We don't have this kind of strategic debate, strategic debate that you can observe in the UK uh, or in France. Uh, military is still a very, very sensitive issue, not only issue not only for politicians, but only for also for people in in Germany. If you ask people, is is military a legitimate means of foreign policy? I think eighty percent of Germans say no. Um, so it's it's a learning process, a learning process under under duress and under stress. Um, and you will always have this kind of approach by Germany trying to link military issues with the rebuilding of Ukraine, for example, with an economic approach, which is, I think, helping things. It's necessary, um, but we still have to focus on being able to defend ourselves. And that is coming back there. There, there is a tradition for that, and I think social democrats know very good about that because 
in times of Willy Brandt, we spent like four to five percent of GDP for for defense. And we're slowly, step by step, are going back into that mindset of being under threat. The, the last thing I was going to ask, because you you alluded to this uh, uh, about the about the UK and about, and I wonder what our uh, our colleagues also think about this. I mean, yesterday, of course, we've had this deal cut between uh, Sunak and von der Leyen who, in, in in Windsor, and then he's been today to uh, Belfast. Uh, a, to to sort of celebrate it and to try and sell it actually but largely of course not just to a business but also to the DUP in particular but also there's been a fair you know dear Rishi and all this kind of stuff is is and is the you talked about the cooperation that which is everybody always talks about that the defense cooperation with the U. does that herald a kind of closer relationship going forward now between the EU and UK obviously we're in the European movement we we in Scotland in particular, a, a st certainly Stephen and I, would be very keen proponents of the idea of rejoining uh, as soon as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, realistically, we know that's not going to happen. But anyway, but we would. But do you think, I mean, how do you see the outcome of that cooperation, which has taken on the, on the, on the security defence side, spilling over into the wider UK-EU relations? Uh, look, I would also like to to have you rejoining the European Union, to be honest. Um, but I, I think after the, the 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 very very difficult years of Brexit negotiations, um, where we had a lot of traumas, especially on the European side, but also on the British side, I think um, this um, moment, this historic moment, where defence and security cooperation is very clearly on the forefront, and it's it's needed and it's it's being done. We are cooperating inside NATO very clearly. It creates a climate, um, as I said before, where we find ourselves in a common place. And that allows for more flexible thinking on how Europe and, and the UK can, can work together. Um, I, I always thought that security and defense would be one of, the, uh, one of the areas that would be ideal for that, because we have common interests when it comes to Russia, we have common interests when it comes to China, as well as the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean. There are a lot of common interests. Um, so the, the current moment helps us overcome some of the traumas of the Brexit area, but I think there need to be concrete steps done. Right. So we could be. I was interested because what you talked about, how the you know the, the EU could not absorb, as it were, the well, the Western Balkans, Ukraine, and everything else. So we're back to a kind of what well, I think they used to call it variegated geometry or concentric circles, and and uh, you know. Core yeah. Europe and long, you name chats, it. long chats with Joachim Bitterly when he was the uh, foreign policy advisor to Cole. Anyway, about that. So, what do you think, uh, a uh, Juliet, about the uh, and Stephen, about about the relations that 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 the, the, the closer cooperation, if we hope, between and certainly in defence and corporate in, in defence and security uh, between the EU and uh, UK. Uh, will that spill over into improving relations between us in, across the board, uh, given yesterday's events as well? Uh, I'll go first, because, and then defer to Stephen, because I think he, he's going to have a better answer than, than I have on this. But I, I don't see much spillover. I, I think that I think it's a it, it's it's fairly easy for the UK and the EU to have kind of one relationship in defense and cooperation, particularly under that NATO umbrella versus another kind of relationship in in other areas. And I also think that I think the UK trying to be out front and very pro-Ukrainian, especially with military assistance compared to other countries, is on the one hand welcomed by other European states, but it also I, I, I sense that that people also see it as this kind of global Britain idea, this post-Brexit um, trying to to, to be a big power and 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 be everywhere and be in in a leadership position like that. And so I think I think there's room for even in within that cooperation kind of um the the bad feelings of Brexit to come in and help interpret it and and maybe create not not as much cooperation as as you might have otherwise. Thanks. Um David I'll I'll make a couple of observations. One of them would be in terms of rejoining or not the EU, is that these are, are of course, political questions. And 
politics never stands still. If we think about where we are now compared to a year ago, we think about where we are now compared to two years ago. Um, so it never stands still in the, the set of circumstances in which we find ourselves is constantly evolving and changing. So I'd say, first of all, in terms of the UK rejoining the EU, I'd say never say never. But of course, there is there are a number of political changes that would need to, to take place. On the question of um, of security cooperation, I still maintain that this could potentially be an area for detente between the UK and the European Union. I, I know a couple of years ago, um, David McAllister will regularly, David McAllister is the German chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who's um, very proud of his Scottish roots, he's half Scottish. He often talks about what he thought was the great loss that foreign and security cooperation was dropped by the UK in terms of any future agreement between the UK and the EU. And I, I think he considered that rightly um, to be something of a missed opportunity. I also think that if you think about in terms of how politics changes, I can remember about three years ago, maybe I, I, I might be wrong, um, Julie can correct me, but when the UK's um, strategic review came out and the references to Europe in that were utterly minimal, whereas there were very significant references to the UK as an Indo-Pacific power. Now, the UK is not much of an Indo-Pacific power. In fact, ironically, France has got more claim to be an Indo-Pacific power than the, the UK has. And actually, that document looked out of date when it came out, because at the time, the politics and the government was to pivot away from Europe, but looks very significantly out of date now, whereby it's difficult to argue that the UK's main security priority is anywhere other than Europe at the moment. I, I don't think you could seriously argue that. So... I think over the past year, I think you'll hear praise in Kiev, to be fair, and in Warsaw, Vilnius, Tallinn, um, Riga, for the way in which the UK reacted to last year's February extension. And to be fair, Ben Wallace and the extension of selling arms very, very quickly. And I think there's an opportunity to build on that from a political level because it gives you the political cover, if you like, to deepen that cooperation. I think Julie was right. I think there aren't that many areas that are not covered by NATO, but there are some areas. And actually, I think that the European actors, and notwithstanding, I got it wrong earlier on, and Christos was quite right. Of course, we've got Malta and Cyprus outside um, NATO as well, so forgive me for that. But if you look at the vast majority of countries which sit in NATO, but that's not to say that if you're France, Germany, Poland, you will not be looking at that very significant security role that the European Union has to play. And you could see that the UK is a serious political, act, a serious security actor in Europe, um, is you know perhaps a leading security actor in Western Europe, um, along with France. It, it seems that both have got an awful lot to offer one another and have a common goal as well in terms of stabilization in Europe and seeing a, a Ukrainian victory um, in that war. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, there's a fascinating long read in the in the FT today uh, about about the European Peace Facility and how much it's bought in terms of the uh, the equivalent of 325 tanks. 36 attack helicopters, uh, more than 200 multiple launch rocket systems, you name it, a thousand drones, etc., which is completely unthinkable, completely unthinkable. Uh, just as the conversation we're having with Christos, for me, as a kind of, as I say, for an old German correspondent 30 years ago, absolutely unthinkable that what they're doing now, even despite all those reservations about, you know, military. Uh, a military role for the Germans. Anyway, I think it's long overdue, probably, that we asked, you know, uh, let the audience propose some questions. Uh, you know, got a very useful questions. Um, so I'm going to start with my old friend Bill, Bill Roger. Uh, he says, "Is the Second Cold War now inevitable? But this time, with the US, EU, UK in one camp, and China and Russia in the other. And if so, should the Ukraine war be seen as a kind of proxy war?" In much the same way as was Mozambique or Namibia, it was an interesting uh, analogy with Africa. And if that uh, analogy is anyway, yeah. So, what do you think of that, Christos? Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief and provocative. Um, Excellent. I, I don't think we should try to go in the direction of a new Cold War. 
Um, because first of all, the old Cold War seems cozy, stable, and controllable in hindsight, but I don't think it was. And it will be even more difficult to control a, a dynamic of uh, antagonistic blocks in, in the current um, situation we are globally in. Um, the Cold War was kind of an iron uh, curtain between two systems with nearly no exchanges, um, if you exclude some raw material from Russia to, to Europe. Uh, now we have a globalized economy worldwide, um, and that makes um, a confrontation between two blocks very, very dangerous um, and costly. And the second thing is, uh, when we're discussing the, the, the Russian war against Ukraine, we forget that there are other crises um, uh, ahead, um, not least the climate crisis. So we are in a, in a situation where we globally need, on the one hand, to confront actors like Russia clearly, confront and deter them, but on the other hand, also cooperate with Russia as well as China on other issues, on global challenges. And therefore, um, I think there are politicians trying to go into that direction, but I think it's dangerous. You any comments, uh, Juliet, or, Juliet or, or Stephen? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Christos that we shouldn't go for another Cold War, but I do I do, and, and that the world is very different than the Cold War. So even if you had the same kind of rivalry, it wouldn't it wouldn't look the same. Um, but I do worry about some of the Cold War dynamics of kind of enemy enemy images. Um, um, Russia seeing the U.S. and the West in certain ways, um, the U.S. seeing Russia in in certain kind of uh, essentialist ways, and I and I worry about putting China in there. I think I think. I think the West has an opportunity to still work with China on this so that the China-Russia alliance is not an inevitable dynamic that, that can't be worked on, um, that, that, that this is not the time to be having trade wars with China. I think this is not the time to have, be having balloon wars and a lot of anti-Chinese rhetoric coming out of some of the capitals. I think this is the time to I think China is a bit more pragmatic on on this issue, even though they they agree with Putin's kind of version of the anti-West. I don't think they agree with Putin in terms of expansionist, aggressive, risky kinds of foreign policies. And I think that that is a wedge that um, that if we if we don't take advantage of that, um, we we could end up in in into some of those Cold War dy dynamics. Yeah, before you, uh, Stephen, uh, before you, uh, you make your comments, there's a there's a kind of related question from John uh, Kapuska, who's who's asking about precisely the way in which uh, Putin is framing this as an anti-Western war, or that the West is determined to dismember Russia, of course. And if that narrative, he says, becomes accepted by China and Iran, he brings in Iran, of course, is there a danger this could become a global country of Western hegemony versus non-Western hegemony? And how can we avoid that? So I think it's a really interesting question. I think, first of all, um, sometimes I think that, you know, during Julie's answer earlier on, I was just thinking about some of the real near misses that we've had in recent times in terms of the US elections um, and what could have gone either way there that, that really could have, in terms of where Italy's gone. I think Christos um, raised that and some of the leadership was shown there, the French elections um, as, as, as well, and, and the near misses there. Because with the, and, 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 and although I raised, and, and, and I think Christos and Julie were right to highlight this, although I raised that this war has been going on for nine years, it was a significant change. That full scale invasion trying to seize Kiev a year ago it was a change. Um, something that was Vladimir Putin was clearly emboldened to do. And just thinking of all those political near misses that we that we had, that's a terrifying prospect of if we had, say, for instance, Trump had won a second term, Vladimir Putin had been able to get away with his war of aggression in Ukraine, had won, um, and the kind of future that the threat that would have posed to Western democracy, to democracy, all around the world, and that that's the stuff of nightmares. And before I, you know, I don't think we should ever lose sight of that, um, of what we are standing up to in, 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 in Ukraine. Because I think in recent years, a number of people across political spectrum and outside politics as well, have been far too forgiving of Vladimir Putin. And that's part of the reason why we ended up in the situation in which we have ended up in. 
Now, on these points, I think there is a broader issue here. You can't, I think you have to treat China differently from Russia. I will refer to my colleague, Phillips O'Brien, I know Julie won't mind me doing so, who's written really some great stuff and have a look at his substack around the war in Ukraine, but also on the role of China and how it sees it and the, the fact that China has been put into a really difficult position. And in Iran, I mean, you have such an odd coalition, I don't think it is a coalition of Iran, Russia and China, who've got very little in common, actually, um, Iran, which is a pretty unpleasant um, regime. So I don't think we can allow it to develop into a war of anti-Western hegemony. And what's been really interesting over the past year is that the Ukrainians have learned so quickly in terms of their PR in the West, you see that with Zelensky, the way their army is learning all the time. They're so quick in their feet in learning. There's so much we can learn from the way Ukrainians have reacted. But what I found really interesting diplomatically recently is that the Ukrainians have extended their diplomatic reach into parts of Asia, Africa, South America, where they didn't have, where they didn't have a presence recently. And so I think that information war, which the Russians are so good at, is something that actually we're starting just to play catch up, which is to make sure that that disinformation and that polarization, which allowed Russia to get away with quite a lot in Chechnya, Syria, and in that first stage of the, the Ukraine war prior to last year, is something that I think we need to learn from. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, there's a couple of questions which are quite specific about uh, negotiations or whatever. A, um, David Brew, another colleague of ours, it says, do you think Russian withdrawal to Crimea and Donbass would a be, a, be acceptable to Russia with whilst Putin's in power and B, constitute a stable long-term position involving recognition of Russian annexation, in other words, of uh, Ukrainian territory, uh, which I think often uh, a, is suggested that in fact, the, the French and the, uh, and the Germans in particular have been pressing uh, Zelensky to do that. Uh, and, you know, and Alan Duke says that there's a view this war must be ended by negotiation. And that must clearly include the Ukraine as the history of post-war settlements made by great powers over the heads of other countries involved, as in Yalta, for example, is not encouraging. So what do we think of that? Stephen. I'll come in. Can I just make one observation on this around, first of all, Ukraine is a democracy. And what's been really interesting over the past year is that if you look at opinion polls in Ukraine, um, that I think the overwhelming majority, and I'm doing this from memory, please correct me if anybody thinks I've got this wrong, the overwhelming majority of Ukrainian citizens now do not believe in exchanging land for peace. And that's a really interesting development, you know, in the same way that Ukrainian citizens are now overwhelmingly in favour of joining NATO and joining the European Union, which is a shift in Ukrainian public opinion. And in a democracy, public opinion is not inconsequential. And so even if, and I don't think he will, but even if Zelensky was to make a move on this, well, he'd pay a heavy political price and you would get somebody elected who would be elected on the basis of not giving up land for peace. I, I think the Ukrainians have given up far too much at the moment. Um, and I can't see that as being a solution anytime soon. And I think for those of us in... Western Europe to be turning around to Ukraine and telling them, we need to give up bits of your country in return for peace. The Ukrainians will turn around and say, well, which bits of the, of the United Kingdom or which bits of France are you willing to hand over? Now that might sound like a very, very crude argument, but in a democracy, public opinion matters because if Zelensky were to go against, and I don't think there's any indication that he will, he will be replaced by somebody who will be more reflective of public opinion in Ukraine. These things, public opinion might not count for much in Russia, but it counts for a lot in Ukraine. Christos, do you have a view about this? I mean, I think it's quite important, yeah. Yeah, you, you provoked me by um, mentioning the Germans and the French. Um, yeah. I think that was a phase in the very beginning that where people still thought that there was a rational actor in Moscow um, and that you can somehow influence his cost benefit um, uh, thinking. But the, the latest that I heard, and you might have read it as well in the Wall Street Journal, was the, this idea of kind of freezing the conflict at the 2021 borders whilst um, uh, offering NATO membership to the rest of Ukraine. Um, because you can't just offer something from the Ukrainian side without getting anything. Um, 
And remember that we had this situation in, in fact or de facto um, since 2014. Nobody really, um, we, we had the sanctions against Russia, but they were quite soft when they occupied Crimea. Um, we, we're in a, in a very, very difficult dilemma here. I fully agree with Stephen, there is the public opinion in Ukraine, but there's also public opinion in our countries and our interests are not the same as the interests of Ukraine. Ukraine wants to win this war and by that internationalizing uh, as much as possible. I don't think the same applies for us. Um, so th there is an issue um, of a very complicated finding of a of, of, of very complicated way to ending this, this fighting. Because on the one hand, we should be aware of the fact that whatever Russia gets out of this war, it will be an award for a, an aggression, an unprovoked aggression. So if we want to preserve the multilateral rules-based order or what is left of it, uh, we shouldn't award that. Um, on the other hand, um, there is also a price for ending fighting. Um, there, there are lives lost every day in Ukraine. Um, so this is also something we should try to do. Um, and, uh, and, and third, if, if we're talking about ending this fighting, we should think about the sustainability of that. Um, because what we have seen with this Russian foreign policy is we have seen the aggression against Crimea, then the aggression against uh, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. What will be next? Um, if we pause it now, how can we assure Ukraine that the, the next attack won't come whenever Putin is ready for that? Um, so I, I believe that there will be negotiations, but it will be very, very difficult and piecemeal. Um, and it will uh, need compromises, not only from from Russia and Ukraine um, as the directly in, included actors, but also from us. Yes, Julia, do you have, um, I mean, how, how, how's your sense of what, how, what, the way in which leaders, since you were talking about leaders, yeah. are thinking in terms of negotiation? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm usually an optimist, but not but not in this case. Um, I think from, from Putin's mindset that negotiations aren't, at least at least right now are not are not on the table because he does see it in the Russian capabilities and interest in the long term to wait to wait this out. Even if he would agree to some kind of land exchange, I think there would be constant incursions from Russian forces uh, and and support for Russian uh, supporters inside those regions. So I I don't I don't I don't think that's a um, I don't see that on the near horizon in any way. And, and as Christos reminds us, the, the the price for negotiations for Ukraine are very different than the price of negotiations for those that are supporting Ukraine that are looking out for other, other conflicts and other issues um, and other bread and butter uh, trade-offs that are happening in, in the States. But but I, I, I wanna agree with that, the point that came from the question in the chat that, it won't work if there's just a, a West and Russia settlement on this without the Ukraine. So the the you know the the mantra that you hear across Europe is uh, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, and that 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 should be a, a very strong lesson that we learn from history. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a question which goes, relates to I think part of Stephen's question about you know the ones which he posed about you know about the European Union, what does European unity mean for NATO, et cetera. And it's quite interesting here where the uh, Bernhard Blumenau, uh, I don't know if you know him, uh, 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 Christos, not a friend of yours. Anyway, um, is asking a question here, which is about the recalibration of dynamics within Europe. I mean, this was a topic which has come up, I think it was, came up actually funny enough in The Economist and in a webinar they did at the end of last week, which I watched. I mean. Whereas the EU, you know, ECEU used to be led by the Franco-German locomotive, locomotive, you know, we now see Eastern and Central European states trying to take the lead and call for more action. Germany, however, and for instance, continues to be a hesitant actor and doesn't seem to be willing to lead European states in the response, despite the sight and vendor. And France seems equally cautious. So... Does the wall mark a watershed or site and vendor of dynamics within the EU? And who's assuming leadership here? That was all. Uh, I, I think that's I, a question for Frau Carbo in the, in the first instance. 
I'll, I'll defer to Christos on this. Um, uh, I, I guess my, my point is leadership is not just about the countries, it depends on who's in power. So, um, and I think France's role in this would, would really depend on Macron and his, his, his orientation in this, which has changed during this war. And then if there's any replacement of Macron in the, in the future. But I, I, think, I think Christophe is better placed to answer this. Um, I'll, I'll try at least. Um, and, and I think you, you're absolutely right about Macron. And if you see his moves towards the European political cooperation, um, this is something that is leadership um, because he's bringing forward the this, this kind of access routes into the European Union and, and making the, the, the room of thinking a bit more flexible. This idea of the, the center of gravity moving towards the east, I think, is something that is based on rhetoric um, and it's very much focused on security and defense. Um, and that is not the core strength of the European Union. So when we're talking about what the European Union is really about, which is an economic integration and is uh, is kind of this, this standard setting um, uh, uh, union of, of 27 member states, there I would say Germany and France are still calling the shots um, because the main proponent of this central European, uh, central Eastern European countries is Poland. And there you have the PiS government with a very bad track record on, on the rule of law. So the credibility of the Polish government inside the European Union is mm, to, to, to be very, very diplomatically here is not the best. Um, and when you talk about German leadership and being hesitant in that, that is only applicable to the military issues or security and defense issues. If you remember the Euro crisis, and I was in Athens during the Euro crisis, you saw um, a very clear German leadership here. If you remember the migration crisis or the, 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 the COVID crisis in, inside Europe, you had German French leadership changing things for, for the European Union in, 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 a far, in, a, in a fundamental kind of way. So I, I think if we're talking about the European Union becoming a security and defense um, uh, uh, actor, you might need the initiative coming from Central Eastern European states, but you will still need, need leadership from France, Germany, but together with Poland, hopefully. You have this Weimar Triangle, which is, I think, still the ideal um, vehicle for leadership inside the European Union, but it's, it's hugely dysfunctional, mainly due to the Polish-German um, relationship at the moment, which won't get better until the Polish elections this year, because part of the dynamic between Germany and Poland is based on the fact that the PiS government is raising anti-German sentiments because it helps them in the, in the domestic elections. Well, I was going to ask actually if, you know, precisely if the civic platform or someone like that wins in, in the Polish elections, would that change that dynamic? And, and Stephen, uh, how, how do you see this now? Because it's quite interesting because a lot of this has been led by, as we've said, by small states. And you, of course, would like to be probably foreign secretary of a small independent state called Scotland. Uh, a, uh, I mean, what kind of role do you think this is? What do you think this dynamic is going on here? Is, is the Franco-German locomotive, has it, like, like Jessica Arden said, run out of steam? Or, or even oh. Nicola Sturgeon herself? Well, look, I think, well, first of all, on a point of information, you know, Scotland would actually be, if you look in European terms, Scotland would actually be a pretty medium sized EU member state if it was. And that's something that sometimes in, in the UK in particular, we think in terms of um, European member states of being the size of Poland, the UK, Germany, France. But actually, um, you could have a lot, a lot of the Scot Scotland wouldn't be a particularly small member of the European Union. But that apart, it is one, it would be one that would have to get the principle of multilateralism and the fact that your security um, relies on cooperation of others. And this is something that, you know, for example, really impressive politicians like um, Prime Minister Kallas in Estonia gets really. So these are areas whereby if you play your cards right in the European Union, you can have political influence, even if you come from, I mean, Estonia is what, a country of about 1.8 million people. What are its political priorities? Its political priority right now is 
security and ensuring its independence and continued security from a neighbour that has invaded it um, on a regular basis, whose leader talks about a return to the Soviet period. And we might think this is just rhetoric, but if you're sitting in Tallinn next door to this um, Goliath next door, and not a particularly friendly one, then these are threats you take extremely seriously. And you pull every single lever at your disposal to ensure the continued independence, sovereignty of your country and the safety of your citizens. And at the moment, the biggest levers that you can pull are NATO membership and European membership. Now, none of this, I think, and I, I don't want to talk too much about something when I've got my, my learned colleague Bernard has, um, has posed a question, my good colleague Bernard has posed a question, he knows much more about Fr French and German politics than I ever possibly could. But I do think that sometimes we can overlook the countries in the east of Europe with these very different political priorities than those we're used to. Those that are comfortable member states within the European Union, Christos is right. I mean, the Polish will be looking at their elections and the government will be looking at pulling levers to ensure electoral success. I'm afraid that's the problem when you have 27 member states in the European Union. I think that you have a a general election on average once every three months or something like that. So it's always going to be a dynamic um, in, in these areas. But also I think sometimes we look at the power of, especially in countries like the UK where you get unitary governments. But if you think about Germany, for example, I think, for example, Annette Baerbock, and I, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm not a German speaker, but Annette Baerbock has played a really significant role in this as well as the foreign minister. So you see that you see that it's an area where individuals can have a really important role to play. So I, I, th I think you're right that Franco-German engine is still incredibly important, but I think that as the European Union continues to evolve, that um, these countries of the East with very significant concerns and also with a public that will be pushing them to ensure their um, sovereignty and their independence in the face of Russian aggression, I don't think this is something that will be inconsequential to the way in which Europe evolves, because Europe is driven by the political priorities of its leaders in the member state capitals. And if you're in the member state capitals of a large number of members, your number one priority is security from your big neighbour to the east that has caused you so many problems in the past. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, well. Yeah, I agree with you actually about the uh, about the about the about the Greens in the German coalition government. They played a they played an extraordinary role, and uh, both of them actually Habeck and and Habeck and as well as Baerbock. And, and, and anyway, there is a question which I guess probably Christos you may be able to answer, which is can to what extent can the EU from John Brand go, to what extent can the EU coordinate procurement and logistical support? Very specific question for Ukraine. Uh, I mean, given, you know, there's always been a lot of talk I've been, uh, about, you know, Europe facilitating the kind of getting all these defence manufacturers to come together. Mon Dieu, I, I used to write about that stuff about 15, 20 years ago. I'm not quite certain. We had at one point, we had something like 25 tank manufacturers and, and 35 armoured vehicles manufacturers in, in each country wanted its own. So... How far is that going to happen, do you think, as a result of this war? I think the war will speed up developments here. Um, but um, you, you alluded previously to the European Peace Facility, and this is, I think, the most um, applicable instrument here. It will probably run out of funds very soon, uh, and I'm quite sure it will re be replenished. Um, because it's something that works for Ukraine right now. The European Union can buy weapons and, and can train soldiers uh, with, these, uh, with these funds. Um, but at the core of, of this kind of changing of a European defence industry and the common procurement are the member states. Um, you have the European Defence Agency helping and supporting there. It will be an um, ever more important role, but... Um, what we also see in this war, and this is kind of the diverging effects, is, for example, Poland wanted tanks as soon as possible, and they couldn't find them in Europe, so they pulled them from South Korea and the United States. You will have these dynamics um, with European partners, but the, this war is, and that sound, sounds cruel, is somehow a chance, because many European armies have emptied their depots. Um, they've sent all of them to Ukraine, so there will be a need to buy new weapon systems, and it's a chance to do that coordinated, 
to enhance interoperability. And that applies not only to the European Union, but also to NATO, especially to NATO. And I think that will be the kind of political driving force that is necessary that wasn't there before in the times you talked about, where every member state was quite finding themselves in a very safe place and trying to cushion its own defense industry for the little tanks they provided. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, we're coming towards the end now. So I'd like to kind of basically uh, ask uh, all three of you, because we've talked about, um, you know, this could be a prolonged war. Do we, how long do you think, right, quite explicitly, how long do you think this conflict will go on? One. And two, how do you think it can best be resolved? So we'll start with Juliet. Julie. Oh, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> no, if I had a crystal ball, um, I, I think a long time. I mean, I, I see I see this conflict because of the the consensus, the pro-Ukrainian sentiment, despite these divisions that Christoph Christoph uh, mentioned earlier. I, I see no kind of compromise, no giving away Ukraine coming from the West anytime soon. And for the reasons I talked about with Putin. So I see this as years in the making, unless there's a big development. Um, to me, the best case scenario would be a peaceful transition of power inside Russia. Um, I don't, I'm not optimistic of that. There, some Sometimes these personalistic regimes crumble more quickly than we think. Um, and it's really hard to see from the outside. So think of the kind of Arab uprisings that happened at times. Sometimes they can crumble pretty quickly and sometimes there can be a, um, uh, a, a more democratic transition. I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't bet on that, but you asked what's the best outcome and that's what I see. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> Sorry, I don't yeah. have to unmute myself. Yeah. What an impossible question, and I'm um, to, to answer. I'm looking forward to Christos's answer as well. Um, I think I think Julie's right. We're not going to see an end to this war anytime soon. I think there's some appalling things that we need to get to grips with here. One is Ukraine's fighting for its life, and if you if you speak to Ukrainians, there were a number of things that extended this war. The actions of the Russians in places like Bucha and Irpin means that if you're, if, if you're Ukrainian, how can you possibly leave your citizens in, in Mariupol or, or, or elsewhere under the boot of um, a Russian aggression ag aggressor who will carry out the most appalling and barbaric um, acts of war crime, and I don't think there's any other word for it, on your on your land. And in a democracy, public opinion, as I mentioned, counts. And so I can't see the Ukrainians aren't going to pack up and stop fighting anytime soon. Um, from the Russian perspective, and actually, as we saw in Putin's speech last week on the first anniversary of the extension of the conflict, we saw a very belligerent tone. I think that Vladimir Putin has invested his political survival, because, you know, in, 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 in these kind of politics, you do not you do not fail in politics, lose elections, and then end up, I don't know, maybe in working in a university or something like that. You lose your job, that's it. You lose your life. And if we look at those around him, Bogusin, um, Kadarov, all these really unpleasant warlords, I don't think you're looking at an administration in the Kremlin, even if, even if Vladimir Putin were to fall down stairs or fall out of a window, which apparently is, 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 is a, a hazard, um, if you're in a senior position in the um, Kremlin, there's an occupational hazard with these kind of accidents. I don't think you see a particular change. So I think that poses, and I think as a final comment, if this war is going to continue, Ukraine will keep finding and, and Russia will continue to pose a threat to its neighbours. Then, And also as, as the US becomes an increasingly unreliable partner, I think that this means that debates and discussions about how much we spend and the political investment in our own security 
is something that we need to take much more seriously in both the 27 member state capitals, but also in the capitals of the countries that sit outside the European Union. I include London in that, I include Edinburgh in that, and I include Dublin and Oslo in that as well. So these issues aren't going away, and we need to really think about what European security looks like in the aftermath of this war. I agree. Yeah, quite. Uh, well, I'm like Juliet Rowley. I normally have a take the view, you know, the old Gramscian view, which is, you know, optim uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. But in this case, it's deep pessimism of the intellect and, and kind of rather minor optimism of the will. So, Christos, du hast das letzte Wort. Oh, um, and it, it won't be optimistic. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we're in for for, for the long uh, run, um, and it, it will be a, a very difficult situation. And what I'm afraid of a little bit is what it happens 2024 with the U.S. presidential elections. If the support for Ukraine becomes a domestic issue in the United States, that will make things very difficult because I don't think Europe in the broader sense Stephen described it, will be able to step up that early. Um, and there is also a second danger, which was alluded to, I think, by, uh, by Blinken a few weeks ago, that China starts providing weapons to Russia and starts using this war as well as an opportunity to kind of tire out the West um, um, on the cost of, of Russia and Ukraine bleeding out at the same time. Um, so making um, or giving that a more global uh, dimension to the war. Um, and therefore, I, I think you asked also about the resolving. Um, of course, Ukraine is in the driver's seat here, and I fully agree with Stephen. But this war has an, has an international dimension. I don't think it will be resolvable without the United States, first and foremost. I think it will be the, the decisive actor. And it might probably also need to include actors like, like China, maybe Brazil and others um, to come on board and find um, uh, ways to isolate Russia more, um, make clear that this won't work. Um, but in lieu of what Stephen said about the regime in Moscow with Putin or without Putin, um, we need to find a way of, how, of dealing with this government. And by dealing, I don't mean making deals, but kind of having it in our neighborhood because it won't go away, unfortunately. Um, and we can't make it a huge North Korea. That would be too dangerous and, and too costly for us. So I'm not very optimistic. I'm very sorry for that. Well, thank you very much. Well, can I thank, first of all, the audience uh, for, for attending, uh, you know, in, in quite large numbers, you know, uh, about half of, the, half of those who registered, but at least, Anyway, thank you very much. And thank you very much for your questions. I hope we answered most of those. Uh, a special thanks to all three of you, the speakers, for highly informative, very, very, inter and very interesting and very chilling at times. You know, uh, you're right, got a bit of pessimism, but also some, some quite kind of strong you know, optimism and, and recognition of the bravery of the Ukrainian people and what they're doing, I think, which is very important, the role of leadership. I think it also shows, it's, I think it's great that we can have these kind of discussions, you know, in Scotland. Uh, I'd like to have more of them. I would like to promote more of them. Uh, and thank you very much in particular, uh, Christos, for coming from, you know, coming all the way from, from Vienna uh, uh, back, to, back to the UK. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next year at this time for a further discussion about wh where the war is going. So... Thanks all to three of you very much indeed, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a pleasant evening. Ciao. Just, just.